Welcome to the Boardroom Zen. I am your host, Megha Joshi. In this show, we hear the untold stories and best practices from world-class business executives on how they deal with pressure and setbacks in the boardroom and beyond. Yes, these business leaders are no superhumans, but they have found their unique formula to stay grounded and bring their A-game to the table amidst the chaos. So let's begin. Today, I bring to you a special guest who grew up in a small town in northeastern Italy. After graduating from Bocconi University in Milan and spending time in consulting following her love of media and travel, she moved to London to pursue her dream job, which was traveling around the world while working for a music company. Several years later, after moving to New York and attending the prestigious Stern School of Business, she joined a e Networks, where she now serves as a Senior Vice President, Global Content Licensing, Planning and Finance. Over these years, she worked in a variety of roles, always focused on fueling growth areas. First, expanding the company's international channel footprint, then the content sales business, and now supporting the rapidly expanding digital content sales business. This guest loves books, music, travel, great art, and good food. Please join me in welcoming our lovely guest for today, Kiara Boyle. Kiara, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kiara. We're excited to have you here. So, Kiara, tell us a little bit more about your early years. I know you grew up in Italy and transitioned to corporate America after your undergraduate years. What advice would you share with others who move across continents and who aspire to reach top executive positions like you did? Well, I think particularly Italy towards the U.S., that is quite a big jump culturally, also in terms of corporate culture. I think I was lucky because I, I moved to London in the middle, and I always think about it as, as having been an easy bridge. There was a fair amount of difference between Italy and the UK, but I was there for a few years and some of the different cultures, a little bit more similar to the US, kind of seeped through. And so when I moved to the US, I was a, you know, it was less of a shock, let's put it that way. And because I moved with the same company, well, there was also some of the corporate culture that followed me. And so it wasn't such a big, uh, such a big difference necessarily, but, you know, Growing in, in my career and trying to, and trying to sort of like climb the corporate ladder and reach an executive position. There were certain, certain things that were very different and I, I had to learn and a couple of things that helped me. One, for sure, going to graduate school. I understood, you know, from the academic perspective, a lot more about the differences and how businesses worked. And that was really helpful. But I think the thing that helped me the most is when I joined a &E and I started looking around and seeing how, particularly how other women interacted amongst themselves and with, with men and with senior people, how sort of the executive group interacted amongst themselves. And I started looking and understanding that there were certain things that I had absorbed growing up in my culture in Italy that were not going to work for me. For example, I had learned uh, to be sort of, you know, I'd grown up understanding that you needed to work and uh, provide excellent work, but always be quiet, never make, never make polite, not particularly aggressive. Being aggressive is always a bad thing. It was always seen as a negative yes. in somebody's uh, personality. And, you know, my voice needed to be soft because I was a girl. And, and it was, it was something that was just part of the culture. Nobody actually told me that, but I kind of absorbed it growing up yeah. there. And I did have some excellent mentors and people within the company specifically kept pestering me about, you know, be louder, speak up. Why do you have all these ideas and you never talk about them in larger meetings? Why are you always good at one-to-ones and, you know, never in a large, so why is your voice so, so loud? So how did you take that piece of feedback? How did you respond to that? Was that an immediate mm. shock to you to come here and have to be put on <laughs> the podium? I think it was mainly at the beginning, I was quite defensive about it. I didn't, I didn't quite like being put on the spot. I thought, you know, I always did well before coming here and my, my work should speak for itself. I shouldn't actually be putting on a mask of somebody that 
I'm not, I'm not loud, I'm not particularly aggressive, why should I be? But then little by little, I sort of realized that nobody would judge me for speaking up. And that was one thing that was very important to me. I didn't want to be judged. I didn't want people to look at me and think, oh, you know, that, that idea is terrible. You know, no idea is terrible. I had to understand that, you know, I wasn't, it was... So it took me a long time, however, and so that was a big thing for me. And just, you know, accepting that my ideas were good, as good as anybody else's, and people could have taken them up or not, but still, it was okay to put myself out there. I think that was the biggest learning for me. And once I learned that, I think things went a lot more smooth in my career growth. Yeah, that's so interesting. And Kira, you said something that brings up this question around imposter syndrome with me, when you when you moved here, did you ever feel like you weren't good enough or your ideas weren't worth sharing? And how did you overcome that oh. limitation in your head? Oh, I think imposter syndrome, that never changes or, you know, like I think a lot of us have it. Women tend to have it a little more, I think. And that's always there lurking in the background a little bit, but being aware of it. And knowing that's there and that's all it is helps a lot. So yes. I just think that with experience and I've been in the, in the country now for 20 years and always working in, in corporate roles, I think little by little, you, you come to realize that everybody feels that way a little bit and that, yeah. you know, your ideas are, are just as worthy as anybody else's. That's it. And uh, you also tend to not take it personally if people disagree with you. Yeah. And that helps too, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's creating that distance from emotions, and especially the the negative emotions that play on our head all the time. That voice. Yes, for okay. sure. Yes, for sure. So, I I see, Kira, you moved pretty quickly in in the corporate ladder, and in your you know recent roles, you work very closely with the executives at E Networks. How do you prepare yourself to breathe the pressure that comes with? Being in those boardrooms, how do you optimize your performance and stay calm amidst the craziness? Well, I like that you assume I always think calm. I do like that. (laughs) Well, this has been happening a lot more over the past few years. And I think for me personally, I think that's a very personal question. People are more or less confident depending on the way they are. But I need to be prepared to be calm. Mm. So I prepare. I time myself. I script myself. So I do that for sure. The other thing that helps a lot is to be able to to feel that like we are in control of our content Mm. so that we are the experts on what we're saying. So once I know that I'm completely confident and this is something that I'm completely confident about sharing, then I think a lot of that tension goes away and I'm just there to share what I know. And that becomes more of a peer kind of conversation when that happens. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so for me, it's really, it's really sort of like owning the content and also knowing my, my audience, you know, it's different to present to, to a, a CFO where I'm much more confident because I work in finance and therefore the language is the same yes. or to present to a CEO who's a much more focused on maybe other aspects, creative aspects, larger business aspects, in which case I, you know, you have to tailor your message to whomever it is that you're talking to. But knowing that, I think, and, you know, making those connections within the company, having, you know, some one-to-ones with, with the executive teams, making sure that you know what they're looking for, what their style is, I think also helps when you are in front of them and presenting to them, because you don't feel like you're presenting to a a bunch of strangers, you're actually talking to people who whom you know. Yeah, yeah. And having a real meaningful conversation to drive intended outcomes. And what I heard, heard you say was you know, two aspects there. The, the, I could hear the, the art and the science, the science being knowing your craft, knowing your space, owning it completely, which is you know, preparing for it or going all in. And then the art being knowing your audience, you know, gauging them, changing, adjusting your message according to you know, where they are and what language makes sense to them and really engaging them more deeply. And 
And those are such great call outs, Kiara. So thank you for that. I mean, I'm interested in asking a little bit of a more personal question, if I may, because okay. I, of course, <laughs> because I do think others can benefit from, from your insight on this. Is my peer and is my friend, I know that both you and I have a, a petite frame. We're both, you know, tiny and probably five, two in our height. And in, in a world where corporate executives are expected to have a certain archetype when it comes to physical appearances, whether it's how tall someone is, how well built they are. You know, when they walk into a room, do they feel like uh, somebody's entering the room and their presence is being felt? And given our physical characteristics, I'm just very interested in hearing your point of view on how you stand out in those situations. How do you leave your mark despite you know, the normal deviations we have from the so-called norm. Ah, the normal deviation from them. Well, I think it's a fact that it cannot be disputed. You know, if you are tall and, you know, you have that physical presence about you, it's a little bit easier to be heard, at least at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, that first impression, it's obviously more powerful if you are owning the space. And in our case, you know, we have to work at other other aspects of our personality, I think, you know, there are, it's clearly, I think this is really just, it's the first impression. I think that's where, that's where it really impacts somebody who is not, you know, following that, that kind of stereotype for, for an executive. But I think once people know who you are and, uh, you know, you know, you're, they know you're competent, they know, they, they, they trust you. So. That is obviously something that, that helps afterwards. But at the very beginning, I think you have to focus on other parts of your personality. You know, I, I like to think I have a good sense of humor. People may disagree, but I tend to use that sometimes. I make sure, I make sure my, my appearance is always something that I'm comfortable with. So I, I keep an eye on that. I want to make sure I always look put together. Yes. And uh, so that makes me feel more confident walking into a room, regardless of I wear heels. That's for sure. But, you know, I think, I think all these things that make you feel better about yourself clearly help, but also pushing on parts of your personality that, you know, are your strongest, are your strongest part. So, you know, your, the tone of your voice, the way you present, yeah. you know, as, as I said, sense of humor or particular aspects of our demeanor that are, uh, that are really so that normally stand out, we have to focus on those and lean on those you know, to make the first impression. But then again, I think, you know, I think also being small is, or petite, is a, you know, can be an advantage. People think we are innocent and not very aggressive. And then, you know, they'll have a surprise when they'll see <laughs> that we are confident and, you know, and assertive and we can do so we can be mighty as well. Yes, so. yes, small but mighty package, if you will. And, and yes, exactly. And all you hit on are such great aspects, Kiara. How we communicate, how we show up, how we feel, how we engage with others, how we make others feel in that moment. Right. I think those are all the game changers and can be used and leveraged in the very best ways by people like us that may not have those more commanding physical characteristics. And that's OK. Mm -hmm. And I will share something personal about me. When I worked in corporate settings, I, I actually look way younger than my actual age. And I've, I've moved pretty quickly in the corporate totem pole, too. So I've been in positions where my broader team has people that are way elder to me. And they may look at me as somebody that is, you know, same age as their grandchild, right? So when you walk into that room and when you start to engage those people, you're already walking into some preconceived notions about you. And my secret sauce has really been about engaging with those people and letting your wisdom, intuition, authenticity shine through because people are put in certain positions, not because of their age or number of years of experience, but because of what they bring to the table, their caliber. And at the end of the day, you have to let that shine along with your personality and who you are. And when you lead with that thought that you're enough, that 
your age, your color, your sex, your physical characteristics don't matter as much. That's when, you know, I've seen the rubber, you know, hit the road in in a way. So something I wanted to share is you shared your perspective. So Kiara, the other piece I would love to explore further with you is intuition. (laughs) And when I say that we as leaders and as human beings, we have intuitive abilities, but we don't necessarily use them as much. We lean so much on data and facts. And so I'm just interested in learning from your own experience. Do you lean into your intuition as you're making decisions and driving success amidst your teams? I think the quick answer to this is probably not as much as I should or maybe not as much as I could. My role has always been in and around finance. So and it, it is a good role for me. I'm, very, I'm a very analytical person. I thrive in sort of analyzing data, analyzing options. And this is in my personal life as well as in my working life. So I'm not one who tends to lean on intuition a lot. What I would say from the work perspective, Having been in my business for quite some time and having learned a lot more about what's going on in my industry and uh, having experience of sort of different, you know, cycle within our industry, I feel quite confident, much more than I used to. I feel quite confident making certain decisions out of of more of a gut sense. Mm -hmm. But that really comes from, in my case, comes from the confidence that I know how certain things are going to pan out. Mm -hmm. For example, somebody in my team told me recently that they feel like, you know, I make decisions quickly and how can they get to that point and how can I make decisions? And they felt like I was making decisions out of intuition. In reality, I think it's really intuition born of experience. Yeah, Yeah. Because, you know, my personality is such that, you know, obviously we all know what's right and what's wrong and we try to do the right thing at all times. But I think that sort of that that inner sense that things that this is a good decision or not, in my case, is certainly supported by by experience. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel confident. And that's because I am an analytical person. Yeah, yeah. Especially working in the in the finance and business planning realm, I can see how you'd be very data driven. Yes, data driven and I'm data driven. I mean, I don't know, you know, which one is the chicken or the egg, but I'm also data driven, you know, in my personal life. Yeah, yeah. And so, and that one, you know, of course, as you, as you grow older and you, you learn that certain patterns always happen, you know, your, your, your intuition probably takes more of a, more of a center stage. But, yes. you know, I'm, always, you know, I will always rely upon data. Yes. To, uh, to feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And have all the facts before we make decisions. Wonderful. And I wonder if ever in in your professional career, you've had a meltdown when things have not (laughs) gone as planned. And if, if you did experience that, how did you recover from it? And what did you learn? So you and I were talking about this earlier, and I originally thought, oh, I don't really have meltdowns anymore, do I? <laughs> but in reality, and, and you know, I, don't, I certainly haven't had like a, a major external meltdown in a long time, and I hope not to have any in the future. But I think, you know, internally, of course, we all come to situations in our professional lives where we wish we had done things differently. We wish we had approached an issue differently. We wish we could do it all over again. And things are out of our control and we feel like they're out of our control. That happens a lot. I think personally, if this is just related to me, I like to take take some time and some space. Mm -hmm. So I will get out of that call or the work I'm doing that's causing this and take a walk, do something, something physical maybe, and sort of take take some time and space and, and approach it later. Yeah. So that's the first, you know, in turn. But if it is with a team, say a presentation went terribly wrong, or there is a, you know, we all made a terrible mistake. And we saw, it's, uh, I think, number one, taking responsibility, making sure nobody's pointing fingers. That's super important. The way I I manage my team is, you know, we all have to take responsibility for our work, but in the end, I am the one who's responsible. You know, it will never, you know, it it will, it will also have to, to, to reside with me at some point. Yeah. 
So, and then, you know, take a step back and making sure that we actually learn something from it. There's always something to be learned, yeah. whether it's to be more accurate or to think about things differently or not to make certain assumptions, right? Yeah. So, so I think uh, that's what you learn from those. And, um, and usually it's very, it's very rare that things are not workable, right? So yeah. you always come out a little bit wiser and a little bit stronger from a situation that would have caused a meltdown. Yeah, so. yeah. And if you put things in perspective, you know, we all will realize and recognize that it's not the end of the world. There's, there's more to solve. There's more to look forward to. And, you know, at minimum, we can walk away with some great life lessons from those experiences that looked very ugly in that moment. But when now that we look back at them, they, they left with it a nugget of wisdom for us. Yes, or they can even open the door to, to something we hadn't thought about mm -hmm. before, especially if we go about it in a certain sort of rote manner. And maybe we, we made that mistake, but you know, it did happen to me recently that we, it was a big presentation we had and there was something went wrong, but that opened the door to a different way of looking at things. And we ended up embracing that and actually doing something very differently because of it. So you yeah, never know. Yeah, yeah. Meltdowns can be good yeah, sometimes. Exactly. There could be, you know, opening new doors to opportunities. Lovely. Yes. Kiara, I absolutely enjoyed our conversation as I always do. So I'd love to thank you for oh, coming coming to the show and, and being my esteemed guest and sharing all those interesting insights, especially from your earlier time you know, moving here from Italy and, and traveling around the world. I found them really, really intriguing. And thank you again for joining me here today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. There is no better time than now to build resilience, lead mindfully and with purpose. We all deserve to live our very best life. This show is brought to you by The Resilient Human a company on a mission to develop authentic leaders that thrive amidst pressure and have the courage to write their own story. A sincere thanks to all my listeners for the precious time and presence. If you genuinely enjoyed the show, I'd love for you to subscribe and leave a review on your favorite listening platform. Be well, and I can't wait to see you at the next episode of The Boardroom's End.